friends. I am very, very excited about the video that you are about to watch because it is the result of an event that happened in our home one night. In fact, it was in the middle of the night that Jack awakened me and said, Rexella, the Lord spoke into my heart and actually given me some new revelations about what's going to happen in the future. Now, he's been studying the Bible a long time. <laughs> to have this happen in the middle of the night where God had actually revealed something brand new to him excited my heart, and I know that you are going to be blessed by it. Now, there are really three parts to what the Lord wanted us to do. The first one, prophecy, 21st century revelations. The next one, seven mystery years. That's the one you're watching right now. And the apocalypse unraveled. And uh, I am so grateful that Jack was open to the leading of the Lord about the book that God has given us as our guide to tell us what's going to happen in the future. And Jack, I'm so excited to do this with you today. These are revelations that God has brought to my attention in the middle of the night many, many times concerning scores of misinterpretations of prophecy or even myths or traditions. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, verse 13 to the clergy of his day, you make the word of God of none effect through your traditions. Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, we are not of those who handle the word of God deceitfully. That's going on today in many, many pulpits. It shouldn't when it comes to prophecy because... 2 Peter 1.19 says, We have a sure word of prophecy. Do you know that, and I said this on video one, but bears repeating for numbers two and three, that if we were to take 17 prophecies, the law of compound probabilities tells us that if all 17 were to happen, it would be one chance in 480 billion times a billion times one trillion that they would occur. Well, just in Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 17 and 21, we have more than 17, and they've all happened right to the letter. Now, there are 10,385 verses in this book dealing with prophecy out of 165 thousand total verses. That means if a minister were to preach the Word of God as he should, verse by verse, one out of every 16 would have to do with the return of Jesus Christ, and yet the majority of churches and ministers today never mention the subject. How sad. Well, I'm going to obey God. 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, preach the Word all 10,385 verses on prophecy alone, plus the other subjects. And I'm going to correct a lot of errors once again in today's video. If you don't have the first in this three-part series, you want to get it. Again, the name, Prophecy, 21st Century Revelations. Um, I just jotted down five things that we did on that first video. Um, number one, the greatest and newest argument for pre-tribulation rapture. It's very, very shocking. Proof that the greatest revival in history will occur uh, during this seven-year period of tribulation and the error concerning the Holy Spirit's removal during the tribulation time. A lot of people think the Holy Spirit won't be here during the seven years of horror on earth. And then proof that multiplied millions who heard the gospel before the rapture have a second chance during the tribulation time to open their hearts to the Lord. And lastly, the 21st century timetable for the greatest event in history. Now, getting into this one, uh, and of course, this is entitled The Seven Mystery Years. Oh, let me pick up on that, Rexella. In Webster's Dictionary, a mystery is defined as a religious truth which can only be revealed through a revelation from God. And, of course, these revelations that the Lord gave me were based entirely on the Word of God. Because 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's the Greek word, theopnosis, God breathed. And 2 Peter 1.21 says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So I base everything on the Word of God. But 
I have studied this precious book some 80,000 hours over the years. If one were to sit down and begin a study of 80,000 hours, it would take nine full years without ever stopping to eat or sleep. Nine years of 24-hour days to delve into this precious and holy book. I've memorized 14,000 verses. I have over 1,500 prophecy books, which I have read and marked in my own personal library. So this is not just the figment of my imagination. But in the middle of the night, God would take these 14,000 verses, which I've memorized by subject and chronologically from Genesis to Revelation, and begin fitting them all together as you're going to hear today. And I can again assure you that this is God's Word as we cover the seven mystery years. Well, we've had some horrifying things happen in the past. Just what will it be like during those seven mystery years? Well, I'm awfully sorry to have to say that we cannot even remotely measure the past uh, to what's going to happen as far as the horrors that will be on earth during that seven mystery years. I'm reading from one of Jack's books, and uh, he puts it like this. We are closer than many think to this terrible moment in history. Increasingly in time technology is being offered to an unsuspecting public. Advances in satellite tracking systems, bioengineering, global communications, video imaging, bio mouse fingerprint scanners, and skin implants or invisible tattoos. The stage for the tribulation is now set. And in the words of Scripture, the hour or punishment, indignation, trouble, destruction, darkness, trials, wrath, and judgment is near. And I'm so sorry that uh, we're going to see this happen during that seven years, Jack. And I thank you for that book. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And uh, you've written a lot of good things about what's going to happen in the future. Well, Rex, all of these seven years are unfolded in Revelation chapters 6 to 18. And Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, describing the last 42 months of that period, call it the Great Tribulation a time when God's wrath is outpoured upon the face of the earth, Revelation 16, verse 1. The Old Testament prophets describe this period of time in very, very dark terms. Jeremiah said in chapter 30, verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none, none is like it. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to the same time. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as never was since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be again in the future. And we'll see what the prophets and Jesus meant as we continue. Now we're talking about the seven mystery years. I've almost given it away as far as how long uh, that period of trial and tribulation will be on the earth. But uh, I'd like to go back in history and see if they believe that. Actually, Ephraim the Syrian, uh, the Orthodox, uh, uh, Orthodox religion, proclaimed a pre-tribulation rapture hundreds of years ago and said this in one of his manuscripts, the book of the Cave of Treasures. He revealed that the whole tribulation period would encompass one week or seven years and calls that period of time the sore affliction. So uh, Jack's analysis of how the length, uh, how long this tribulation period will last, goes all the way back to the very beginning. Uh, those great theologians believe that too, Jack. When the Antichrist comes to power, Daniel 9, 27 says he confirms the covenant of peace for one week. In the Hebrew Bible, that is one Shabuah, and a Shabuah is seven years. In Greek, it's heptad, also meaning seven years. When one gets to Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, and chapter 12, verse 6, he discovers that one half of the tribulation period is 42 months or 1,260 days. Multiply that by two and it comes to 2,520 days, which is seven years in the Jewish calendar. For their calendar, 
totaled 360 days per year. So 360 times seven is the 2,520. No doubt about it, it will last seven full years to the day. What nation on earth or nations on earth or government will be ruling during that seven years, that seven mystery years. Well, let's uh, again go back uh, to the Jewish Talmud of all places, and it states in the book of Zerubbabel, Messiah, son of David, will arise and vanquish the demonic dictator. We're going to be talking about that man, that dictator in just a moment, and his strong, united, listen to this, Roman Empire. Oh, well, is there a Roman Empire now? Let me just go on. The great Jewish commentator, Shlomo ben Yitzchak, said, The people of the prince that shall come in Daniel 9, 26 and 27 are from the legions and people of Vespasian and Titus, the Roman military generals. Thus, a Roman Empire shall make a covenant with the Jewish nations during the seven years for that length of time for seven years. Now, some of the information that I just gave you is actually pre-Christianity. And uh, now, let's see what some of the theologians in the Christian faith had to say. Let's start with Martin Luther in 1540. He said, all the world agrees that Rome will be the final world empire. And a famous Catholic prophecy revealed at La Salette, France, on September 19th, 1846 stated, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. And in 1987, you notice the progression here, friends? I started way, way back with the Jewish Talmud. And now, 1987, the Belgians minted the first ECU silver coins imprinted on them. Guess what it was? The bust of Emperor Charles V, crowned head of the Holy Roman Empire in 1519. Why was Charles chosen to be immortalized on the first ever European coin? Because of the striking uh, similarity between the European Union and the Holy Roman Empire. Now, theologians of the past agreed on the fact that uh, the, Ro the revived Roman Empire would be ruling during the seven mystery years. Jack, do you agree with them? And uh, why do you agree? Totally, Rex Ellen. You know, I got a letter this morning from a dear lady and her minister, I won't mention the denomination, said, I don't want you listening to this stuff. We don't believe in this experience called the rapture, nor do we believe in a seven-year period of tribulation and a revived Roman Empire, nor do we believe there'll be a thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. Some of these churches today, 80% of the churches within Christendom are preaching blasphemous air, and we have to correct these things. Now, I'd like to debate some of these ministers who seem to have all the answers. I've got thousands of hours into research, and let me ask you, sir, give this to your minister if he doesn't believe these things. Can you disprove what I'm saying about a revived Roman Empire coming into existence for the final seven years of history just before Jesus Christ returns? Then write to me and prove it. What I'm about to say goes all the way back, and I'm going to regress now too, Rexella, to the year 110, when Barnabas, who was the partner of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 14 through 19 stated that there would be a revived Roman Empire at the time just before Christ came to earth. Barnabas, 110. In 180, the great church father and historian Irenaeus taught the same truth. In 310, Bishop Cyril said, the teaching of a revived Roman Empire at the time of the end is inundating and flooding the churches. The man who did the Latin Vulgate, the great Catholic edition, one of them of the Bible, Jerome, taught it. But then in 431, air crept into the Christian church, promoted by Origen and Ambrose, who influenced St. Augustine to teach many of these wonderful things concerning the rapture the tribulation, and the coming millennium. 
We entered then into the dark ages, a thousand years when men had no Bibles. They couldn't study these things for themselves. And so mass confusion reigned. But then God began to restore light into this darkened scene. And these gray truths came back into existence. So much so that in 1890, Dr. Arno Gabelin, an Episcopalian, proclaimed the rise of the revived Roman Empire for the end time just before Christ were to return to earth. In 1908, Dr. C.I. Schofield, a Congregationalist, proclaimed it. In 1920, Dr. Harry Boltum, a Christian reformer, in 1938, Dr. Harry Ironside of the Plymouth Brethren Movement and pastor of Moody Memorial Church proclaimed it. And then we had in 1940, Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, a Presbyterian. In 1948, Dr. M.R.D. Hahn, also a Christian reformer who became an independent, all teaching that there would be a revived Roman Empire, which I believe is the present European Union. Right at this moment, we have Dr. John Walver, Dr. Dwight Pentecost, Dr. Grant Jeffrey, Dr. Hal Lindsay, Dr. Jack Van Ippe, yours truly, uh, Bishop Dougherty of the Catholic Church, Fathers Tumber and Fund, all proclaiming a revived Roman Empire. All right? Can you dispute all of this? Can you prove all these men to be wrong? Plus, my 1,500 prophecy books at home, all practically saying the same thing? The Holy Spirit leading us all in this direction? Let me say this. They got this idea from the Word of God. Remember that vision that Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 2? Actually, it was a dream. And in that dream, he saw this huge image that had a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, stomach and thighs of brass, two legs of iron, and ten toes of iron mixed with clay. He couldn't understand what it was. Oh, if only his magicians, astrologers, and soothsayers could help him. They couldn't. But God sent a prophet by the name of Daniel. And as he stood before the king, he said, Oh, the Lord God of Heaven has revealed unto me the secrets of what is to come in the future. And he said, first of all, you are that head of gold, Babylon. But he said, I hate to tell you the rest. Go ahead, Daniel. I won't hurt you. What is it? He said, the chest and arms of silver are going to overtake you, the Medes and the Persians. Then there will be an empire called Greece, typified by the stomach and thighs of brass, who will overtake the Medes and the Persians. And then the two legs of iron, Rome, will overtake Greece. Two legs, why? Because the Roman Empire was divided into two sections. Then he said, there'll be a long lull, like the legs are lengthy. And at the time just before Messiah comes in Daniel 2.44, he said, there will be ten toes still of iron because the empire revives, comes back to life. But it will be in a deteriorated form because it will be mixed with clay. Were all these men right or wrong? Can we prove that they were right? Yes, from the Word of God. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, we have Babylon. In chapter 8, verse 20, the Medes and the Persians. In chapter 8, verse 21, and chapter 10, verse 20, Greece. In chapter 9, verse 26, Rome. Revive Rome, second Esdras. Now, Daniel even outlines it for us. He says it will begin with ten nations forming the revived Roman Empire. Of course, in 1948, we had the origin of the movement when Benelux came together. And by 81, when Greece joined, they had 10. And that's Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 20. But then it was to grow to 13 in Daniel chapter 7, verses 8 and 24, and then become global in 
Daniel 7, verse 23, for this dictator devours the whole world, the new world order, a one world government. Same thing in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 3, chapter 13, verse 1, and chapter 17, verses 3, 7, 12, and 16, pictures the 10. That was by 81 when Greece entered the European Union. But this one who arose out of the Mediterranean, Revelation 13, 1, devours the world as well. For verse 7 says, uh, he had power over all kindreds, tongues, people, and nations. Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at that hour. We can prove it. Can you disprove it? Whoa. <laughs> now, we have some questions here, and I think if you were sitting here, you would be very anxious to ask Jack this question. All right, if there's a, the revived Roman Empire, and that's the European Union, is there a ruler coming out of there? Yes, he told us a moment ago the Antichrist would be coming right out of there. He will be the global leader with the global government. Now, is he alive right now and waiting in the wings to take over, Jack? I was thrilled when I picked up some of the Catholic periodicals and I read La Zavator Romano inside the Vatican, New Oxford Review and many others, all recently said, we believe that the Antichrist is alive and waiting in the wings. And I believe it because everything he's supposed to do is already moving in that direction as we'll see throughout this tape. Right. Well, the Bible gives this Antichrist or this super deceiver many, many names. And I'm going to go back and forth with Jack here and uh, give the name that the Bible calls him and uh, then have him give us the reference. He's got a computer up there, friends. I, I don't know how he got that implant. Must be from the Lord. <laughs> but it's up there. All right. The first one, the bloody and deceitful man. Psalm 5, verse 6. The wicked one. Second Thessalonians 2, 8. The little horn. Daniel 7, verse 8. The prince that shall come. Daniel 9, 26. The vile person. That is Daniel 11, 21. Got it. Yes. <laughs> the man of sin. That's 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. The son of perdition. Same verse. All right. The Antichrist. 1 John 2, 18. The beast. Revelation 13, 1. The king of fierce countenance. Daniel 8, 23. The abomination of desolation. Oh, that's Daniel 11, 31, Daniel 12, 11, Matthew 24, 15, and Mark 13, verse 14. <laughs> there are many details in the Bible about this man, friends. But I think the general picture is that a European coming out of the European Union will arise, have power over the Western world. But I have another question. Maybe you're thinking of the same one. Is he Gentile or Jew? Oh, there's a lot of controversy about this, but I agree with the great Dr. Dwight Pentecost who says he is a Gentile. First of all, because he arises out of the sea in Revelation 13, 1, and the sea always pictures pagan Gentile nations in the Bible, Isaiah 57, verse 20. Secondly, uh, the prince that shall come is of the people who destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Who did that? Vespasian and his son Titus, Roman generals in 70 A.D. Thirdly, we have all of these nations we mentioned a moment ago, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And this last one arises out of the old Roman Empire, but he has all the characteristics of the preceding nations that blended into the final Roman Empire, and they were all Gentile nations. So I think there's no doubt about mm. it that he's a Gentile. The Bible says that the world is going to actually worship him. Now, how does this man get so much control and so much power? And I, I think I want to ask this next question of Jack. Does Satan somehow control him, maybe even incarnate this man? This is so interesting. The Bible teaches that when he arises, Revelation 13, 1, he is controlled by Satan, the dragon in verse 2. But something happens. He's already reigned for three and a half years, only controlled by Satan. But as the final 42 months comes into existence, the last three and a half years, something happens in heaven. It's recorded in Revelation chapter 12, beginning with verse 7. There was war in heaven. 
Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan, and the dragon and his angels, fallen ones, demons, fought with Michael and his angels, and Satan and his group prevailed not. What's the result? They're cast to the earth. Verse 12 then goes on to say, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, because the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath. Because he knows he has but a short time. He only has 42 months left. It is during this time when he's cast down, right at the beginning of the final 42 months, that Russia marches to the Middle East. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? This Antichrist is slain in battle. Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45, picture the battle of Armageddon. And verse 45 says, He comes to His end. The world is mourning. The global leader is gone. What are we going to do? But Revelation 13, 3 says, His deadly wound is healed. This is when the one who's cast out of heaven, Satan, enters his body, incarnates him, just like Christ was the incarnation of God. And so, he comes forth out of the grave. He's risen. He's just like Jesus who came forth from the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4 centuries ago. This must be the Christ. And from that point on, all the world worships him. Revelation 13, verse 8. And he likes it. In fact, he says, I'm God. The New Age movement has produced their God. Daniel 11, 36 says, He magnifies himself above every God. And 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4 adds, he exalts himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he is God, sits in the temple of God, saying, I am God. That's why this one has such control, because he died and rose again. He must have been, they said, the Christ from 2,000 years ago who has returned because of this resurrection. What an amazing event that will be, see a man come back to life after he's dead. Uh, I don't know what the people will think as they're standing around watching that happen. It must be something. Well, the Bible describes exactly what it's going to be like here on the earth under this Antichrist rule. Here we've got the United uh, Kingdom of Rome revived, and we've got a man. What's it going to be like when he's ruling? I'm going to go back and forth with Jack again, give you some phrases that the Bible says uh, about this seven mysterious years, the seven mystery years. Okay, the first one, Jack. The, it calls it the day of the Lord. That's First Thessalonians 5, 2. These are all descriptive terms of this seven-year period. Yes. Right? Let's go on. The Great Tribulation. Revelation 7, 14. The time of testing. Revelation 3, verse 10. The hour of judgment. Revelation 14, verse 7. The time of sorrow. Matthew 24, verse 8. The great day of God's wrath. Revelation 16, verse 1. The wrath of the Lamb, Jesus. Revelation 6, verse 16. And then from the Apostle Paul, the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10. Oh, my. <laughs> you know, before we get into particulars, and we're going to do that on this tape, I'd like for Jack to give us sort of an overall panoramic view of the seven mystery years. Will you do that, Jack, please? Okay. This covers the entire seven-year period, so listen carefully. It begins when this world leader, the global dictator, comes to power out of the revived Roman Empire, the European Union. Daniel 9, verse 26, and Revelation 13, verse 1. And he comes to power on a peace platform, for he comes in peaceably, Daniel 11, 21. He enters in peaceably, Daniel 11, 24. But when he does, that's why we think that we're right in that era of time, there is a problem over Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, verse 2 says that Jerusalem at that time is a cup of trembling, and verse 3 says that it's a burdensome stone. Well, he overcomes all the difficulties and confirms this peace covenant for one week. And as I've already said, that's one Shabuah, Hebrew, one Heptad Greek, meaning seven years. And the world really rejoices. But Isaiah chapter 28, verse 15 calls it the covenant of death and hell. 
Why? Because it produces a false peace that will not last. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14, and Jeremiah 8, verse 11, pictures the people crying out, Peace, peace, it's wonderful, it's finally arrived. But there'll be no peace. You see, this Antichrist is a clever manipulator. And Daniel 8, verse 25 says, By peace he destroys many. Well, after 42 months, he breaks that covenant of peace, Daniel 9, 27. And all hell breaks loose on earth. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. The first invasion is when Russia and an Arab federation moves into the Middle East. That's Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45, Joel chapters 2 and 3, and Psalm chapter 83, verses 6 and 7. The second move is when China comes down to the Middle East, and that's Revelation 9, verses 14 to 18, and Revelation 16, verse 12. And then the third phase is when all nations come against Jerusalem, Zechariah 14, verse 2, but it's at that moment Mashiach, the Messiah, or our Christ, comes, sets his foot upon the Mount of Olives, and it splits down the center, Zechariah 14, 4. And when he comes, he destroys this Antichrist and his armies. He destroys the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, and destroys the armies in Revelation 19, verses 19 to 21. The next thing he does is to cast this Antichrist and his cohort, the religious leader of the world church, into hell, the pit, Revelation 19, verse 20 and then sets up his kingdom on the earth for a thousand years. There you have the story of the seven years from the beginning to end, for it begins when Antichrist confirms the peace contract in the Middle East, and that could happen at any time, my friend. Be ready. Now let's get into some particulars about what happens during the seven mystery years. Uh, this business of cloning, I don't know how it affects you, but it seems kind of weird to me, and I'm wondering if it's uh, going to really take off as far as human cloning during the mystery years here. I have an article from The Globe and Mail, Toronto, Canada, and this is what uh, they have to say. It was a ruckus meeting at Rome's Umberto I Polyclinic. Three scientists announced that they will clone a human being within two years. Now, they were meeting at one of the hospitals where they're going to champion uh, their vision there. And again, this is from Weekend News Today. Human cloning will be done in Israel. Human cloning. And uh, this article went on to say that Judaism uh, does not rule out human cloning. And again, this is from U.S. News and World Report, a human is likely to be cloned and very soon. Now, there you have it, like within the next two years, and Israel's going to do it, and this is very, very soon. Jack, during the seven mystery years, will human cloning take place? I have no doubt about it because of the appearance of this Antichrist's clone and image that speaks. We used to think this was a robot. It could be, but it could also be an actual clone. For you see, when one looks up the term clone in a dictionary, it says an exact likeness, a dead ringer, the spitting image of the person. So watch the term image here in Revelation 13, verse 15. We see that this world leader comes to power in Revelation 13, verse 1, but in verse 11, there is a world religious leader, head of the global church, who forces the people to make an image, verse 14 of Revelation 13, unto this Antichrist. Verse 15 says, He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image should Speak. Wow. Look at Revelation 14, verses 9 and 11, chapter 15, verse 2, chapter 16, verse 2, chapter 19, verse 20, and chapter 20, verse 4. Every one of these texts speaks about the exact image, the likeness of this one. 
the spitting image, if you will, of the world leader. I believe it's coming. Mm, wow. Well, how can this person possibly keep track of all of us here on earth? And it, the Bible teaches that that's going to happen. Here's a report by David Kupalian, and this is what he has to say. Here comes the digital angel, the new dime-sized implantable transceiver. And it is for the tracking and monitoring of humans, emitting a homing beacon that can be tracked by global positioning system satellites. It is being marketed as the ultimate tamper-proof means of personal identification. When implanted in one's body, the device is powered electromechanically through the movement of muscles and can be activated either by the wearer or by a monitoring facility. Now, recently on our television program, I reported to you that Digital Angel was presented at a United Nations gathering. They illustrated uh, how it could be used. Uh, Jack, is this the type of thing that will be used during that seven mystery years when that Antichrist uh, knows what's going on in everybody's life? I can't believe what's happening in our world today in the light of this book. When one knows all of these prophecies, he is literally overwhelmed like I am to see it happening. I've preached it all my life. It's here. Now, they are talking about putting an implant under the skin through this digital angel project. Now, how do we keep track of all people? That's part of it. But Star Bridge has created the hypercomputer that does 12 trillion 84 billion calculations per second. <laughs> Let me repeat that. It does 12 trillion 84 billion calculations per second. There are six billion human beings on the face of the earth. At that rate, it could produce 2,000 pieces of information on every human being, all six billion of us, per second. I have no hard time with Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18 anymore as to what's coming, as this one controls the world. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now get this, here is wisdom. Let him that hath wisdom count, count the number of the beast, for it's the number of man in his numbers, 600, three score and six. 600 we know, a score is 20, three score is 60, and six. The infamous number, 666. He says, now, if you got wisdom, count the number. A number of months ago, I used a numerical pattern on television, and I thought I was the first to understand this, the first to grasp it, the first to find it. And last week, I was reading a book, and believe it or not, Victorinus, the Bishop of Pateau in the year 270, discovered this. He says, if you want wisdom, if you want to know who's going to be behind this Antichrist and this false prophet who gives the number 666, count the number. Now notice, this has to do with the Roman Empire because these are Roman numerals. I stands for 1, V for 5, X for 10, L for 50, C for 100, D for 500, total 666. Six, six. That's really compelling, isn't it? <laughs> well, you know, we have a revived Roman Empire now, and but there are many nations over there within the European Union. Uh, how are they going to get them to break down their barriers and boundaries? The Council on Foreign Relations has been and is committed to the elimination of existing national boundaries and the merging of all nation states into a powerful world government. Arnold Tornby, in his book Surviving the Future State, says, local nations should be deprived of their sovereignty and be subordinated to a global government. 
Now, former Prime Minister of Great Britain, Margaret Thatcher, revealed something. She said that this would be a terrible thing. It would be the greatest abdication of national and political sovereignty in history. She is totally against letting down the boundaries. She believes that every nation should have their sovereignty. But is it going to happen? Are we going to have, Jack, a world government where there'll be no boundaries anymore? We definitely are, Rexella, and I have scores of quotes that I could use on this. We're heading in that direction and rapidly. Do you know that the European Court of Justice passed a law whereby none of the inhabitants of the European Union nations can now speak out against the European Union and tarnish its image or reputation and are using the old laws that Hitler and Mussolini used, fascist laws, to carry out their program of suppression. Why? They're heading toward this global control where nations will lose their sovereignty and one will say, I am God and control the masses. This is interesting, Rexella. Mm -hmm. A man by the name of Schlesinger wrote a book called The Coming of the New Deal. And in it, he said that Henry Morgenthau, Jr., who was the Secretary of the Treasury back in 1935, persuaded Wallace, who was running for vice president and who was dabbling in the occult, to promote a coming new world order. And because he was the Secretary of Treasury, he dealt with money. And if one will look at the back of his dollar bill carefully, he'll see that pyramid. The eye above it, it's the eye of the sun god. But the words in Latin announce the birth of the new world order, the one world government, mm -hmm. 1935. Well, we've already shown you that when this one comes to power, it starts with 10 nations, Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, moves to 13, Daniel 7, verses 20 and 24, and then becomes global as he devours the whole world, Daniel 7, 23. And when he arises in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 1, he has control over all kindreds, tongues, people, and nations, verse 7. So interesting there, Jack. Well, now remember, we're dealing with only a certain period of time, seven years, seven mysterious years. Now we have a world ruler, we have a world government, and how about a world church? Will we be one church then? Dr. Walverd, and Jack quotes him often because he respects him so much, he is a great theologian. When writing about the final world church said, it was customary in the Protestant Reformation to refer to the Roman church. And even modern expositors have had a tendency to return to this interpretation. It seems, however, that the apostate church includes all Christendom, as well as other religions, the whole united as a result of the trend toward a world church into a great super church. In the time of the tribulation, those who turn to Christ in faith, now this is very important, in faith remain outside this church rather than in it. Thank you, Dr. Walford. That is really well written. And in 1948, the World Council of Churches was formally organized in a meeting in Amsterdam. The goal of the World Church was to unite all Christendom into one great church. And in 1997, 200 delegates from across the spiritual spectrum met at Stanford University to craft a charter to create united religions that stands parallel to the United Nations. So there you have it. Uh, there have been several different organizations who've been planning this for a long time and working on uniting for a one world church, Jack. Recently in San Francisco, 6,500 religious leaders from all over the world gathered to discuss the creation of a one world religion. The Times Media said 
it was strange to be there because one could find no evangelical Christians present. They were not allowed because the other religious leaders said that they were troublemakers and very set in their ways. It's coming, ladies and gentlemen. This is so interesting. St. Malachi's prophecies. Go back to the year 1140 when he, Malachi, was the Archbishop of Ireland. At that time, 1140, he predicted a succession of popes right into the 21st century. Gave their insignias and has been right on up to the present moment. When he got to Pope John Paul II, he said there would probably be only two more into that 21st century, and the final one would be a defector from the faith. I'm not saying this. This is taught by the Catholic Church today. It was taught by Bishop Sheen under tradition of the church theology. So they believe that the time will come when a final pope will defect. And that's interesting because it is said by the other Malachi Martin of the present day who just passed away, a great Jesuit, a great Catholic leader, that Pope John Paul II, so aware of this, that he would do everything imaginable to create a college of cardinals who were so conservative that the next pope following him could not possibly be that person. Could that be the reason that Pope John Paul II has now created one of the largest college of cardinals in the history of the church? He chose a number of conservatives, men, bishops of the church, cardinals of the church who really love the Lord Jesus Christ to avoid what could happen in the very near future. We're living in the last times, and this is Bible prophecy. This politician arises in Revelation 13, verse 1, but in verse 11, there's a religious leader. And when he arises, he has the two horns of a lamb, but speaks as a dragon. The lamb identifies him with the Christian faith because John 1, 29, says that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But when he speaks as a dragon, the dragon is satanic, Revelation 20, verse 2, and this one who defects will do it. Now, I'm not picking at the church. There have been many wonderful popes, and there have been popes who haven't lived the life. Just like Protestantism is filled with those who really love Christ, but is also filled with men who are not truly born again. We have so much apostasy today. We have the Jesus Seminar crowd who ridicule the Lord, ridicule His virgin birth, ridicule His bodily resurrection. Catholic people and the Catholic Church hasn't done that, but Protestantism has, so we're not picking. It's going to be a world church of all those who've been left behind after the rapture. Every denomination of imaginable people who knew the language but were not truly born again. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts far from me, Jesus said in Mark 7, verse 6. And we see the trend right now. Defection galore in all denominations. 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, The Holy Spirit speaks expressly, plainly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the Christian faith, giving heed to seducing spirits evil spirits, and doctrines of demons. It's going to get so bad during the tribulation hour that Revelation 9, verse 20 says, they would not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons. And this Antichrist will say, I'm God. I am God. Daniel eleven thirty six, Second 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. And this religious leader will say, he is God makes an image to him, the abomination of desolation, Christ mentioned in Mark 13, verse 14. And because of it, all the world worships Satan incarnated in 
a man. Revelation 13, verses 3 and 8. Jack, you know, I'm sitting here listening to all of this, and I'm thinking, uh, here in the world we're told, one, a one world government, that'd be great. Oh, here, let's have a, a leader. That would be great, one world leader. All these implants and technologies and all, that's great. But during the seven mysterious years, a lot of bad things are going to happen according to the Bible. In fact, 21 judgments are going to fall. It's not all great. Why all those 21 judgments, Jack? Why is God upset? Because it is a time of unprecedented, unparalleled commandment breaking. The Ten Commandments are found in Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 to 17. Thou shalt have no gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Thou honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness lie. And thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house or wife. What are they doing during the tribulation hour? Let's see. Thou shalt have no gods before me. They have set up a man, the infamous Antichrist, as God, Daniel 11, 36. Revelation 13, verse 8, where they're worshiping him. Number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. This religious leader of Revelation 13, verse 11, has forced the people to make an image in verse 14 to this Antichrist. Three, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. This world politician blasphemes the name of God, Revelation 13, 6. And in Revelation chapter 16, you find him blaspheming the Lord three different times. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? John could say in the beginning of the book of Revelation, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, chapter 1, verse 10. But that's all changed. Because when one gets to Revelation 13, verse 15, and chapter 20, verse 4, Christians are losing, losing their lives for being faithful to the Lord. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. All four of those are being broken in one verse. Revelation 9, 21. They repented not of their murders, their sorceries, drug abuses, their fornications, and their thefts. The ninth commandment is, Thou shalt not lie. Well, in Revelation 21, 8, it says that those who are liars during this period of time are cast into the lake of fire. And Revelation 22, verse 15, pictures the wonderful holy city and says, outside of the holy city are dogs, sorcerers, mur murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loves and makes a lie. There was so much lying, so much distortion of truth going on that now when the holy city has come, they are not allowed to enter it because of the sin of lying. And finally, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not desire another man's property. In Revelation 18.10, it says, in one hour is thy judgment come. And there are 28 different luxurious bubbles that men want. And verse 14 says that their souls lusted after these things. So there are the Ten Commandments being broken in an unprecedented way. And the Lord God is upset. And therefore, the 21 judgments are falling. Let us talk about some of the particular things that will be happening uh, during that seven mysterious years. The BBC gave a sad report concerning diseases. This is very recent. Diseases kill more people globally than natural disasters. Take a listen. The death toll in one year from AIDS, malaria, diphtheria, and other infectious diseases was 160 times higher than from natural disasters, including the Turkish earthquakes, Venezuelan floods, and Indian cyclones. So you can see how devastating the diseases of this world can be. You know, Jack, AIDS is an epidemic in some areas of the world right now. During the seven years, will it be increasingly worse Rexella, the Bible teaches that there's going to be horrendous pestilential plagues in Revelation 9, verses 1 to 5. But let me 
share a few new things. Right now, biologists have been working on reviving microbes that have been dead for thousands of years and have already reanimated 1,500 of them, and any of them could produce new diseases. They're also thinking about resurrecting prehistoric bugs and microbes. God help us when it all happens. In fact, 32 new diseases have been discovered since 1975. Right now in Tanzania, there's a blood-sucking fly that has teeth like files, and it has either killed or injured 68 lions, these massive beasts. These little flies get on them and with their file-like teeth, tear the skin to shreds until these animals die or succumb. Unbelievable things. Then, of course, we know about AIDS. Right now, we're told that in South Africa, one out of every nine people have it. And in the army of Zaire, one half of the troops already have the HIV virus. Where will all of this go? Created by the green monkeys. Now watch this concerning animals. We have the mad cow disease, uh, the hoof and mouth disease, and that's taking cows, sheep, pigs, every animal imaginable. We have mosquitoes creating encephalitis and the Nile fever disease. There's just no end. The Lyme disease created by ticks. On and on we could go. Why? Because Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 7, and Luke 21, 11, there shall be pestilences, plural. But what causes these pestilences? In Revelation chapter 6, where the four horsemen of the apocalypse are described, we find in verses 7 and 8 that the rider on the fourth horse, and this is the one who's named death and hell followed with him, and unto them death and hell uh, was given the power over a fourth part of men to kill by sword, hunger, death, and the beasts of the earth. That's amazing. 2,000 years in advance of what's happening. The beasts of the earth. I one day enumerated some 40, 50 diseases right now, all originating from the beasts of the earth. Surely the coming of the Lord is near. Well, we have another tremendous problem, and of course, we've heard so much about it, and that is global warming. Now, I have here from USA Today, evidence mounts that Earth is warming up, and temperature gains could mean an increase in droughts, floods, and thunderstorms. Again, from the International Herald Tribune, global warming is a fact, so take it seriously. Warming of Earth raises new alarm temperatures rising faster than thought, scientists say. And again, island nations, those like Hawaii and so forth, face results of global warming now. Now they're talking about the tow towering uh, tidal waves that come as a result of that. American coastal regions are also in danger, and that comes from the Associated Press. Now, Jack, will global warming, the ozone problem, and asteroids all be a problem uh, more seriously even than now during that seven years? These are three different signs that occur during the tribulation period, and I wanted to tie them together so we can get as much as possible into this video study. First of all, in Revelation chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, it says, The fourth angel poured out his vial, his bowl of judgment, upon the sun, S-U-N, and power was given unto the sun to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with a great heat. That is going on presently. All of the warming effects, which we call global warming, are coming because of a rise in the sun's rays upon the earth. And it's going to cause mass devastation in the future. Now, you talked about these lowlands a minute ago. Mm -hmm. We're told that Alexandria, Egypt, Bangkok, Thailand, Dhaka, Bangladesh, over to Hamburg, Germany, then Leningrad, Russia, London, England, Miami, New Orleans, Shanghai, China, and Sydney, Australia are all in dire trouble in the very near future. 
because of the rays of the sun. But this presents the next sign in the Word of God, and that's the ozone problem. Now, clouds help us, but once the ozone problem begins, we're in real trouble. And right now, the ozone problem is so large that it's two and a half times the size of Europe. When the ozone is depleted by 50%, what one gets sitting in the sun in six hours, he now gets in only one hour. And when it's depleted 100%, what one would get sitting in the sun for six hours, he now gets in six minutes. You understand? So here are the rays of the sun coming down during the tribulation hour because of this ozone problem. And men are being scorched with a great heat as just quoted in Revelation chapter 16, verses 8 and 9. It only causes global warming, but this additional problem. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, known or ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, the Jews, His chosen ones, the days shall be short. Now, in the beginning of this video, we showed that the tribulation period lasts exactly seven years or 2,520 days because one half of it in Revelation 11, verse 3 and chapter 12, verse 6 is 1,260 days or 42 months. So if God says something is going to last 2,520 days, we cannot say it's going to last 2,000 515 days. You cannot shorten it by one day. God's Word must stand as it is written by the Spirit of God through men of old. What does that mean? I'm so thankful that Dr. Log is in the Moody Memorial Church and others have propounded this idea. It's the shortening of the daylight hours. The sun is blazing. So, Carl Sagan comes along and says, the only thing that could help the world in the future because of the ozone problem is a dust in the air that would block out the rays of the sun and said that could come through an asteroid hitting the earth. Revelation 6 verse 12, I beheld when he opened the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. What does it cause? The sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. You can find that in Joel chapter 2 verse 30, Acts chapter 2 verse 20. Here it is blocking out the rays of the sun to save life upon the earth. And when does it really happen? Right at the end of the tribulation period. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days or toward the end of the seven-year period, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. There it is. Mm. I really don't know if you have ever been in an earthquake or not. We've had the unfortunate opportunity to be in three of them, one in South Korea and a couple in California. But science, scientists have been tracking earthquakes for decades. Now, listen to the report out of Boulder, Colorado. Now, this is a geological survey. From 1900 to 1949, we averaged only three major earthquakes per decade or every 10 years. From 1949, the increase became awesome with nine killer quakes in the 50s, 13 in the 60s, 56 in the 70s, and an amazing 74 major earthquakes in the 80s. And listen, in the 90s, 125 major earthquakes. Take a look at this. Seismologists on shaky ground. The fault lies not with scientists, but with our inability to predict quakes so they know where the faults are underneath the ground. Again, California unprepared for the big one. And there you see a man who's trying to secure the Golden Gate just a little bit better. But many of their buildings and infrastructures are not prepared for that great catastrophe. During the seven years, will we see more and more of this, Jack? Jesus said in Matthew 24, 7, just before I return to earth, there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. The word divers meaning diversified or different places simultaneously. He mentioned it again in Mark chapter 13, verse 8 and Luke 21, verse 11. One can also find that in Revelation 
8, verse 5, chapter 11, verses 13 and 19, and then the greatest earthquake in the history of the world described in Revelation chapter 16, verse 18. There was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the face of the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Well, you don't have to worry out there in California or other places of the world. It's going to happen in Israel. What? Yes. Do you know that when Christ died on the cross, there was a horrendous earthquake, Matthew 27, 54. And when he rose from the dead, there was another tremendous earthquake in Matthew 28, verse 2. But when he returns and his feet hit the Mount of Olives, it splits right down the center. Listen to this. His feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst. That's when Jesus Christ returns. So one of these mornings when the earth begins to rumble over there in Israel, the Lord Jesus will return. Their Messiah will have come. Oh, I'm looking forward to His return. Not necessarily the earthquake, but His return. <laughs> Amen, Jack. One of the worst nuclear disasters, of course, happened in the Ukraine when the Chernobyl nuclear power plant erupted. And uh, I'm wondering if we're going to be seeing more and more nuclear weapons used, accidents, this type of thing, Jack, during that seven years. What do, you, what do you think? We'll talk about nuclear weapons a little later. This is nuclear power. And, of course, the Ukraine was part of the old Soviet empire, the Soviet Union. And then, of course, they disintegrated, as you know. But in the Ukraine, Chernobyl is located. And... They had a horrendous accident there, and so many people even now have the cancers because of the radiation. And it spread into many other places because the waters have become polluted for miles, hundreds of miles in every direction. Do you know that if you were in the Ukraine and you had their Bible and were reading Revelation chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, it mentions how this plague falls into the rivers and streams and poisons the water so that many die. But in their Bible, the name of that star that kills so many people is Chernobyl. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Wormwood in our English version is actually the term Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. And so it's in their Bible. And they tell me that the people of Ukraine are really experiencing revival as they realize that this text has happened right in their day, right in their area. It's one of the signs. Mm. Well, here in the United States, we rush uh, to toughen penalties for drug use, but we're told that we've really lost the war on drugs. And uh, this is a situation around the world. Again, I have a headline for you. Opium's deadly detour brings crisis to Central Asia and the Netherlands tests its drug tolerance. Now their ecstasy is just the latest fad in a nation where leniency is the rule, as you well know in the Netherlands. They're trying to expand their leniency there, Jack. How about drugs? During that uh, mystery seven years, a mysterious seven years, are they going to use drugs more and more? Eric Sal, this is one of the greatest signs in all of the Word of God because this has never happened in the history of the world till right now. And that's the fulfillment of Revelation 18, verse 23. And the word sorceries there is the Greek word phatomakaya, from which you and I get the word pharmacy or drug store. Now listen, this is unbelievable. It states, for by sorceries or pharmakia, drugs, were all nations deceived. Have you ever known of a time in the history of the world when all the nations are earth are dabbling in and being deceived by drugs. This is it. First time. What about drugs? One of the reasons God is sending judgment upon the people during the tribulation hour is they would not repent of their sorceries, of their drug abuses. Nothing wrong as a medication, but just to get high, to go out and commit all kinds of wickedness destroy other people's property, commit crimes in order to get the money for the drugs. 
That's wrong. And so by all the sorceries that are recurring, God is sending judgment and they would not repent. Now, in Revelation 21, verse 8, and Revelation 22, verse 15, it says those who use drugs to abuse their bodies miss heaven. I didn't say it. God wrote it. I only quote it. And when we get to Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, it mentions 19 sins that will keep people out of God's heaven, out of God's presence. And one sees the word there, witchcraft. That is again the Greek word phatomachia, drug abuse. Be careful. It's dangerous business to be a drug user and a drug abuser. Very sobering. There's an ugly mood out there, friends. In the world today, it's called anti-Semitism, and it is a hatred for Jews. And, you know, it's rapidly growing again. Some people say the Holocaust never even happened. Holocaust deniers spread their lies in the Middle East. An estimated 5.1 million to 6 million Jews died during the Holocaust, during World War II. And uh, General Eisenhower in 1945, he was a supreme Allied commander, of course, in Europe. He uh, brought three newspaper editors to Europe to see the camps. He was afraid Americans really wouldn't believe what was going on over there. The Free Press editorial director, Malcolm Bengay, was one who went. I want to read just a few lines of what he saw. I saw hundreds of creatures that were once human beings now reduced to mere skeletons, covered with skin. The only happy ones were piled like cordwood in the yard, waiting their turn at the vast crematory. I saw the long rows of gallows. I saw the clubs with which they were beaten. I saw the lampshades made out of human skin. And some of this, friends, is really too hard to share, too hard to read. You can't imagine the inhumane actions of human beings. But uh, I wonder, Jack, is this mood of anti-Semitism going to continue and go right on into the seven years of tribulation? I feel sorry for the Jewish people. I recently read a 700-page book called Constantine's Sword, written by a Paulist priest of the Catholic Church. And he shows how for 2,000 years the Jews have been constantly persecuted and slaughtered, mainly by Christians. God forgive us. But during the tribulation hour, it's not going to get better. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 9, speaking about his Jewish brethren, you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. In John 16, verses 2 and 3, he said, the time will come that whosoever kills you will think he's doing God's service. And earlier in this video study, I talked about Satan being cast out of heaven in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. When we get to verse 12, it says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time left 42 months and what does he do an anti-semitic purge for the next verse says he persecutes the woman who brought forth the man child that woman was the virgin mary who brought forth jesus a jewess and it'll be one of the greatest holocausts in history someone said to me one day why does the Jews suffer so much because the old slimy serpent Satan hates the Jew because Yahweh God loves them. Oh, how he loves them. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, says, The Lord did not choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest, but because he loved you, Israel. You know, you may have heard us talk about the elect being here during the tribulation. So you say, ha, ah, the church is going to be present. The elect there, you need video one to understand this thoroughly, happen to be Israelites. They're not only his chosen people, but they are his elect. Isaiah 42, 1, Isaiah 45, 4, Isaiah 65, verses 9 and 22. 
the Jews are the apple of his eye, Zechariah 2.8. And while the church is the bride of Christ, <laughs> Israel is the wife of Yahweh God, Jeremiah 3, verse 14. So God loves them. Satan hates them. And I love them too. I have a book in my hand called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. This is the biggest piece of garbage and trash that's ever been propagated on the human race. It was written in 1905 by a Russian Orthodox monk, Sergei Nilus. Oh, how he hated the Jew. The Tsar at that time was so angry with this Russian Orthodox monk that he had all the books confiscated and burned, but some of them seeped through into other nations. This is the book Adolf Hitler used to raise millions of people up against the Jewish people. This is the book Henry Ford, yeah, inventor of the Ford automobile, used to produce anti-Semitism in this country. God forgive me, he hated the American Indians and the Jews. This is the book that Muslims have now translated into seven languages. This is the book that the Ku Klux Klan, the neo-Nazis, the Aryan churches, Aryan, yeah, remember that word for a moment, and the Christian identity churches use. It's garbage. If you ever see a copy, get rid of it. God loves His chosen people. People wonder why Hitler murdered six million Jews because he was a cultist belonging to the group called Thule, T-H-U-L-E. This had its origin in Tibet. And in this cult, they had the secret doctrine involving, and this is what it was all about, seven races that lived in Atlantis. But there was one race superior to all the other six, and it was the master race. And they had pure blood. They were different from the others. They were supermen. They were controlled by invisible spirits, demons. Over the centuries, they reincarnated themselves and settled in Germany, Asia, and the USA. Now, I believe that's a lot of bunk, but I'm telling you what Hitler believed. So he said, in order to preserve this pure blood of the Aryan race, the masters, we have to get rid of non-Aryans and we'll begin with the Jews and the Gypsies and then work our way up into the millions, getting rid of everyone who is not a member of the super race. He actually believed he was God. You know that Third Reich was supposed to last for a thousand years based on Revelation 20 verse 4, Christ millennium. And he was to be the God. Himmler was to be the religious leader who turned people to Hitler. And the SS was to be the converts. Hmm. And so in order to get rid of the inferior beings, six million Jews died. You know, a lot of people debunk this. Well, I'm here to tell you that I believe it with all my heart. Why? Because my uncle, Franz von Impey, who loved the Jews, who tried to help him, was taken to Hitler's camps and exterminated. There's a street named after him in Belgium right now. But let's go a little further. Every male Belgian relative of mine was taken away to work in the camps, to work in the factories making war materials for Hitler. They were hardly fed a piece of bread. They brought home every one of my male relatives, Europeans, Belgians, not Jews, on stretchers, unable to walk because they had no strength. You Aryans, you Christian identity people, let the Word of God speak to your heart. Your religion doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Here is true Christianity. By this shall all men know you're my disciples because you have love one 
for another. John 13, 35. And that takes in all of our brothers in all 33,830 denominations on the earth, as we've just discovered, plus others in other religions, according to Jesus in Luke 6, verses 27 and 28. Jack, you're talking about a master race there. Master race. If uh, In the Bible, Jesus was called master many, many times, and I believe that if we follow the master, we're going to love every race, no matter what the color of the skin or what, or whatever. We're going to love everyone, aren't we, Jack? I love it. When Jesus returns, they're singing in heaven in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, about returning to earth and reigning with him from every tribe, every nation, every language, because we'll all be here united in Christ Jesus. Mm. Most of us have heard the term, the Battle of Armageddon, and uh, not too many of us really know exactly where that battle is going to be fought. In fact, the location of Armageddon, let me give it to you. The area of Megiddo over in Israel, of course, is located west of the Jordan River in north central Israel. This place called Megiddo, where the world's final armies gather for the Armageddon campaign, is the plain of Esdralon, which has been a chosen place for encampment in every war in Israel for centuries. Jews, Gentiles, Saracens, Christian Crusaders, Egyptians, Persians, Druze, Turks, and Arab warriors from every nation have pitched their tents and gathered their armies for war on the plains of Esdralon or Megiddo. Armageddon, then, is the last gathering in this area for the war before Messiah or Christ returns. But we've been there many times, and uh, as I looked over that valley of Megiddo, I thought, oh, Lord, someday this is going to be a terrifying place. War is going to be fought here, but not the final battle. Now, Jack, uh, would you sort of uh, let us know here, there are th really three campaigns in the Battle of Armageddon, correct? Uh, first of all, the Jewish people in the Old Testament call it the Battle of Battles. The Christians call it Armageddon, Revelation 16, 16. It is really, Rex, one campaign, one campaign lasting three and a half years with three major invasions occurring, as we'll see in a moment. But there are those who say, ah, the book of Revelation, Armageddon, wait a minute. The Battle of Armageddon, or the Battle of Battles, as called by the Jews, is found in Psalm chapter 2, Isaiah chapters 34 and 63, Joel chapters 2 and 3, Zechariah chapters 12 and 14, Malachi chapter 4, and Revelation in chapters 14, 16, and 19. It's found in many places. Plus, I could give you many other texts along the way. It's going to be a bloody time. Because Revelation 14, 20 says that the blood will flow to the horses' bridles by the space of a 1,600 furlongs. Those are English figures. In American numbers, that's a river of blood 200 miles long. Now, you see, Israel is exactly 200 miles long, so all they're saying is that there will become a time when the nation is stained and saturated with bloodshed from coast to coast. Now, Rexella. We're going to see that there are three major invasions. In fact, in the Midrash Tehillim of the Jews, they had three major rabbis, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Hokanan, and Rabbi Rav Hunan, who said three times Israel will be invaded, and the third time it will be totally against Jerusalem. I said, where did they get that? And they saw it all in Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45, and we'll look at that in a moment. But when you study that particular text, you see that they come from the north, south, east, and west, the four points of the compass, and we're going to look into that yes, right now. Yes, I'd like to consider the north first, and of course, uh, the far most north uh, uh, to Israel would be Russia. The Avodah Zarda 3b states this, and of course, this is from one of the Jewish writings, the war of Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38 and 39. While we were there in Israel, I ask a lot of people, do you believe in Ezekiel 38 and 39? Do you believe you're going to have a battle here called Armageddon? They do. 
I don't know how they maintain any positive attitude at all over there. Truly, they do believe it. And uh, will be the one of the key events that will usher in the Messianic era. In other words, they believe that this war is going to usher in the coming of the Messiah. The revered Jerusalem uh, Targum adds, At the end of days, Gog and Magog, and that is Russia, shall march against Jerusalem, but perish by the hand of Messiah Christ. They're looking for a Messiah to help them out because they know there's going to be a war there, Jack. And uh, now the first invasion, will it come from the north and, and will Russia lead it? Definitely. Rex, so this is amazing because these ancient Jewish writings going back hundreds of years state that when the war of Gog and Magog, and I'll explain that in a second, occurs, it happens just before the reign of Messiah. And he's going to come and destroy them at his return. That's exactly what this Bible teaches. What is the war then of Gog and Magog that tells us that the coming of Messiah, the coming of our Lord Jesus to earth is so near? Now, this is not some imagination I've created. This is from two of the greatest Jewish writings in history. Gog and Magog, Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. This is described as the war of the latter years and latter days, Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 8 and 15. This is a war where they come from the north against Israel, Ezekiel 38, verses 15 and 16. Ezekiel 39, verse 2, Ezekiel 39, verse 4, against Israel. Eighteen times Israel is mentioned here as the battleground. This is that first invasion, all right? Now, verses 1 and 2 tell us who's doing all of this. Not only do we know they come from the north, and when one draws a line from Israel to the North Pole, it goes right through Moscow, but we have names. Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, and Arash. Gog means nothing more or less than end-time ruler. However, the Caucasus Mountains running throughout Russia in their tongue mean Fort of Gog, Gog's Fort. The next name, Magog, in Josephus, Book 1, Chapter 6, is identified as the Magogites, or as the Greeks call them, Scythians. The Scythians are given the credit for populating Russia. Then we have Meshech. That is Moscow today. Originally was Meshech, then Mosach, then Moskoti, then Moscovy, and presently Moscow. Tubal, southwest of Siberia on the map. Only it's Tobolsk there because it's the Russian suffix SK added to the ending of Tubal. This is the war of wars, ladies and gentlemen. This is the beginning of Armageddon, and Russia comes to the Middle East and is finally driven back to Siberia in Joel 2, verse 20. I'll remove far off from you, Israel, the northern, there it is again, army, with his face toward the East Sea, his hinder part toward the utmost sea. Dr. M. R. D. Hahn in 1940, founder of the Radio Bible Class, said, no other nation on the face of the earth can meet the geographical requirements of Joel 2, verse 20. Just that one simple verse, except Russia. Mm. So Russia and now the buildup of her arms again indicates that uh, she's going to do something with that, Jack, right? Oh, under Putin, who knows what's going to happen in the future or who the future Gog is. Yes. Well, let's look to the south of Israel. And again, I'm taking this from Weekend News Today. Israel increasingly sees Egypt as a potential threat. Israeli defense officials no longer hide their concern over what they said is a massive Egyptian conventional arms buildup. Now, this next sentence was a surprise to me. They said the most impressive achievements have been in the Egyptian Navy. So they uh, have very sophisticated um, Navy forces there, Jack. And uh, I want to ask you a question. Will Egypt join with Russia in this invasion? Very definitely. And Daniel 11:40 says, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. The king of the south is Egypt. Push at who? The leader of the Western army that's there attempting to defend Israel. But hear me, this is so important. Every time you read about the time of the end, please note it is not, it is not the end of the world. Now, Daniel used that terminology, the end time. 
and six different times in this book. But he did not mean the end of the world because in Daniel 2, verses 44 and 45, he has Messiah, or Christ returning to earth. And it says, In the days of these ten kings, the European Union, shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom which shall never be destroyed and it shall last forever and forever here on terra firma, earth. So he didn't believe it either. The time of the end means the end of the age of grace just before one goes into the age of the millennium, Christ's kingdom upon earth for a thousand years. But just before Christ comes, the king of the south makes a move, Egypt. But he has an Arab Federation uniting with him. In Ezekiel 38 verses 5 and 7, he has Persia and old Persia is present Iran and Iraq. In the Hebrew there's Cush and Put and Cush of course takes in Ethiopia and Libya. Put takes in um, some of these other nations like Algeria, Morocco, Sudan, parts of Africa. We also see Tagarma there in verse 7, and that is modern-day Turkey. In Isaiah 17, verse 1, we see Syria entering the fray with the Arab Federation. And then when we get to Psalm 83, verses 6 and 7, and I'm not going to try to prove all these, just get Davis Bible Dictionary. I looked every one of them up yesterday, and all these names include Jordan Lebanon and the Palestinians. Now, why did they all join together? These are the headlines. That same chapter, Psalm 83, verse 4, let us cut Israel off from the face of the earth that their name be no more in remembrance. And the next verse, they could saw it together and agreed. Mm. We're going to get rid of Israel from the face of it, but it won't happen because Yahweh God intervenes as we're going to see in a few moments in Zechariah 14 verse 4 as Messiah appears on the Mount of Olives and a plague hits the world and the armies who've invaded Israel like they've never known. So thus far we have the North, Russia, South Egypt and the Arab Federation. Let's yes. continue. Let's go out to the Pacific Rim and the rise, the rapid rise of China to world prominence may have major, major implications, believe me. Listen to this. Uh, let's go back uh, a while, though. I was quite surprised. Uh, Jack gave me this article uh, to read, and it has to go back uh, 200 years to Napoleon Bonaparte, French military leader, the Emperor of France in 1804 to 1815. And he said, when China awakens, the world will tremble. My, way back then, he was thinking about this. Maybe he was reading the Bible. All right, from Newsweek, China modernizes its army with help from Russia. And from the London Times, U.S. fears Chinese space development. Now, will China join in the invasion there, Jack, into Israel also? Well, back there in Daniel 11, we found that the north and south went together, verse 40. And then in verse 44, it talks about the north and east going together, the Orient and the leftover armies of Russia that were pushed back to Siberia, as I mentioned a few moments ago. But what about China itself? Was Napoleon right? You better believe it. Revelation 16, 12 says, The sixth angel poured out his vial, his bowl of judgment, upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters therefore dried up, so that the way of the kings of the east, plural, not just one, the kings of the Orient might be prepared. In fact, the British Revised Version has the exact terminology of the kings of the Orient, China, Japan, and some of the others. Right. But they come across on dry ground. Yeah. Now that is amazing. People used to mock the Bible. How's that possible? The Euphrates River can't be crossed on dry ground. Well, they had the Antiturk Project, finished in 1990 in Turkey. The president walked in and pushed a button, and the waters went down 75%. And now they have completed the project called the Anatolia Project, and 
They have 21 dams and 17 hydroelectric power plants. And when the button is pushed now in 21 places, they can dry up that area and troops can go across and drag around. Oh. Now, here's the battle described in Revelation 9, verses 14 to 18. And they're coming across the Euphrates River, right? It says, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So that's when the Oriental troops are coming. And then he says that the number of the army was 200,000, 200 million. Oh, 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 that Bible. Wait a minute. Time Magazine 1965 said they could produce 200 million then. But now the latest reports from the CIA, 200 million men. Not necessarily in the army, but trained in China from among their 1 billion, 200 million people are ready for warfare, 200 billion, the exact figure. Do you know when John wrote that, there weren't 200 million people on the face of the earth? It couldn't happen in his day, 96 AD. It's for now. And listen to this. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone, verse 18. Atomic warfare, which we'll again see in another moment. Well, a warning shot on EU Army by the White House. The Bush administration has given a tough warning that plans for a European Defense Force could undermine NATO and provoke a dangerous rift between America and its allies. Now, that's that warning shot uh, that they've given there, Jack. And again, General admits the EU Army will be a rival to NATO. Now, I'm speaking about British General Whiting, and this is what he had to say. The European Union's rapid reaction force will start to compete with NATO once it acquires a full range of strategic military assets. So, can't you imagine? If they're going to become so strong that NATO might go down the drain there, Jack, just how will the EU fit into all of this? We said there'd be three invasions. The first one was when Russia made the move with the Arab Federation and they're pushed back to Siberia, Joel 220. The second is when China makes the move and they are defeated. And in every case there in Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45, it talks about the king of the south coming up against him, the king of the north coming up against him, the kings of the east coming up against him. Him there is this Antichrist who is the global dictator and the head of the EU army. That's where they're fighting the war. Now, we learn, as I said earlier, that he is killed there. He comes to his end, verse 45, but then his deadly wound is healed in Revelation 13, 3, and he really moves to power for the next 42 months. So we believe that invasion one and two takes place probably within the first year after the 42 months. There's peace for the first three and a half years, then it's broken. We're not setting an exact timetable, but something approximating that. It could be the first two years of the second 42 months. And there is going to be an EU army, which I'll prove in a moment from Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 to 6 and Revelation 19, 19. But let me get to that third invasion right now. This is when all nations come against Jerusalem, Zechariah 14, 2. At that moment, Messiah, the Jewish Moshiach, and the one we call our Christ returns. He sets his foot upon the Mount of Olives. It splits down the center. We've already mentioned that. Why has Christ returned? To stop the carnage, to stop the mess, to stop the war. That's right, Revelation 11, verse 15. He comes to put a stop to those who are destroying the earth and destroying one another. Now, there's a plague that comes upon those who've come up against Jerusalem in verse 12. This plague shall be upon those who've come up against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away as they stand upon their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in their sockets and their tongues shall consume away in their mouths. Now that could be 
necrotizing fasciitis, the flesh-eating disease, but I don't believe that. I think it is the neutron bomb which dissolves humans but leaves buildings intact. Sad that they've got such a weapon, but the world has it. Many nations now possess it. And in Demona, Israel, the deserts of that nation, they have the neutron bomb. But this is the closing scene because Christ has come to stop them in what's happening. It's after that that they beat their swords and the plowshares and their spears and the pruning hooks and learn war no more. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4 and Micah chapter 4 verse 3 because he has come to set up his kingdom of peace for he is the prince of peace. Isaiah 9 verse 6. But I want you to see something here. There is an army that attempts to stop Christ from setting up his kingdom and it's this revive Roman Empire or European Union army. Why? Because this one says, I am God. Daniel eleven thirty six, Second 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. This Christ can't come and usurp the throne and take my place. I'm God. I'm going to stop him. Now watch this. The term beast is used 35 times in the book of Revelation. And it's always referring to this Antichrist. So, chapter 19, verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on that white horse. Revelation 19, 11. Who is he? The Lord Jesus Christ. That war is described in Psalm 2, verses 1 to 5. Horrendous war. But it's at that moment, and I gave you the panoramic view earlier, that Christ comes, as I already said, stops it, and casts this infamous world, global politician and his religious cohort into the bottomless pit, into the lake of fire. Revelation 19, verse 20. It's over. Satan is bound in the 20th chapter. And peace reigns on earth for the next 1,000 years. Look, do you want to be ready? You can prepare to be with the Lord Jesus first in heaven to the time of the rapture and then return with Him seven years later for the most glorious event on the face of the earth, the setting up of His kingdom where there'll be no more war. You want to get ready? Look at me and pray this right now from your heart. You see, people make it so hard, religionists make it so hard to prepare for heaven. But it isn't very hard. The thief on the cross said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Nine words. Jesus said, <laughs> today, Shalt thou be with me in paradise. Nine words. Look at me then. Open your heart and pray this. Lord Jesus, thank you for Calvary, for the cross, for taking my sin on your body shedding your blood to cleanse me. And Lord Jesus, I want you, I want to be ready. I will call on you now to be my Savior. Will you come into my heart now, Lord Jesus? Save me this very moment so I'll be ready for your return, either the rapture or seven years later, the revelation when you reveal yourself to the world. Lord Jesus, save me now. Save me now. Save me now. In your name I pray this. Amen. Amen. Oh, I trust that you prayed that prayer with Jack just a moment ago. We've given to you some very serious things on this video. And Satan is powerful, but how good it is to know that God is almighty, 
all powerful and that he has power to come into your life and to change you and to make you his child. You'll be ready for tomorrow no matter what it holds, whether it's serious headlines or perhaps it's a serious problem in your life. If you made that decision, please write to me this week. I'd love to hear from you and send you absolutely free a little book that we've sent out thousands of these around the world, First Steps in a New Direction. I trust that you will write me this week. Let me know about your decision for the Lord. I want to leave you with this thought. I read it the other day and I presented it on our program. We don't change God's message. It changes us. Blessings always as you walk with Him. Bye-bye.